Good to see you. That's not, That's not my, my daddy. daddy. <laughs> All, right. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome, Welcome to Simple Truth Church. Church. Good to, Good see, to you see you here this morning. This morning. I'm, glad I'm glad to be here, here this morning. morning. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, it's good, it's to, good be to be back. back. 18, 18 days. days. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and I have 18, 18 days worth of stories. stories. I, needed I needed to go on the fire just so, just so I could get some more fodder, fodder you know, for, uh, you know, you know, for, you know, for sermon, sermon illustrations. illustrations, you know. You know? And, 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 and I mean, the very first, first day we we're up at Cohasset, and, uh, and, uh, and it burned. It burned. Cohasset, that little, that little town of Cohasset, Cohasset, I mean, it burned. And, and, there's, and there's, they, put they put yellow stickers, stickers on, your on your fence or on the, or on the side of your house or not your house, the side of the garage, garage that's, that's left. And it says, and it says this, this is why your house burned down and we didn't stop, stop to help it. And, it, and it's, it's brutal. brutal. You have wood, yeah, wood stacked, stacked up against the house. There's leaves on top of the roof. There's brush up against your house. There's no defensible space. And you look up there and there's a chimney standing there. Yeah. yeah. So, so it, the very, the very first, first day, day they stage us in this, in this little, little town. town. And we're and talking, talking, I'm talking to this guy, he's a captain, captain from Menlo Park, Park Fire, Department. Fire Department. And so, and we, so start we start talking, and he says, hey, I have, I have a house, a weekend house. house. My family has a weekend house, house up in Grass Valley. Valley. We bought it, bought it a few years ago. ago. Oh, that's oh, cool. So, so how, did how did you get to Nevada County? So we go through the whole thing, you know. I took a job at the sheriff's office from... And then moved, and then moved up, up there. there. We've been there 45, 45 years. And, and, he says, and he says, so, so uh, uh, it, it, he, says, he says, so, well, so how, how, how did you make, you make a transition, transition from being, being, a, being a, a cop to being a, being a pastor? pastor? I said, that's a long story. story. Yeah. <laughs> and he goes, he goes, he goes well, I think, well, I we, think have we have time. I said, I said no, it's, it's a real long story. And he goes, I'm not going anywhere. We're stuck here. So I'm, so I'm riding, riding, you know, the, you know, the guy, guy working with me, he's a little heathen dog with a foul mouth. mouth. And, so and so he gets, he gets to <laughs> hear my testimony, testimony too. too. You know, you know so, so that's, that's how it started. started. And, it and it never ended, ended. You, know, you know, so I'll have, I'll have uh, uh, it, was it was pretty cool, cool you, know? you know. I had, I had a guy tell me that G-O-D is a god of desperation or a god of deliverance. Or a group, or a of, group drunks. of drunks, you know. You know, <laughs> it could be, it a, lot be a lot of things, things but God is, is God of desperation, you know, God, God of deliverance, deliverance. and, and uh, it, goes it goes on and on. on. I learned a lot of stuff from from, uh, from, a, from bunch a bunch of heathen, heathen dogs, dogs, you know. And, uh, and uh, this, uh, this one guy, guy I mean, they they hyphenate four letter expletives with four letter expletives, you know. You know, and it's like, yeah, yeah, those things. That thing is shiny as. I thought, I thought well, how, shiny how shiny is that? Is that? So, anyway, so anyway, I looked at him, I said, that's coming out of your mouth like that. Like that. Uh, uh, I, just I just didn't understand, didn't understand a word you just said. You just said. Because, because all those, all those every, every other word was, was a four-letter four letter word. And he, goes, and he goes, oh, yeah, yeah you, know, you know, ever since I got out, he starts telling me the story. So then after he finishes the story, I come back to I said, hey, tell me the part where you said ever since I got out. I, I, I want to know, know about, about that. that. He, goes, he goes, oh, man, oh, man I, I went to prison. prison. And, uh, and, uh, and he goes, it was the worst thing that ever happened in my life. I said, what would you go to prison for, methamphetamine? He goes, how did you know that? I said, I said because you live, you live in Oroville. And I said, and I said Oroville is the crank, crank corridor, corridor, methamphetamine corridor. No offense to anybody that's from Oroville, right? I said, I said, you know, you know what, they, what, they, what, what you get when you get 12, 12 women from Orville together, together, and he goes, what? I said, I said a full set of teeth. You know, you know so, so I know, I know how that is. I said, I said hey, so he goes, so, he goes, wow. so, then, so he then he tells me, me yeah, we'll see, I'm a sailor. I'm a sailor, so I talk like a sailor. I said, but you just told me you go to the Baptist church and that you gave your life to Jesus after you got out. So you're not a sailor anymore, you're a servant. And so when you're a servant, then you're a salesman. Okay, okay, so... So every, so every time, time I just, just gave him the speech about, that's, about that's, that's just unprofessional. Oh, you, oh, you don't, don't offend me. Don't say, don't the, Lord's say the Lord's name in vain and not offend me. But I mean, you'll offend me. But all those, all those other things you're dropping, you're not offending me. I'm just thinking about how unprofessional that is. You know, you know, you're talking to a captain because everybody has no mechs on, so you can't see their 
who they, who are. they are. You're talking, You're talking to, to a chief, a chief. And, telling and telling him all that, all that stuff. stuff? It's, it's unprofessional. So, so it's, it's amazing, amazing how. how yeah, well, yeah, when I, I, oh, I'm sorry. I'm that one kid. He, I didn't hear him cuss for three days. For, for, because because it, when, when you see me, me around, and then that little heathen dog I'm running around with, he'd say, he's a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> really? And then after they'd clean up their, their mouth, they would pull him off to the side. This one old man says, is he really a pastor? <laughs> yeah, he is. Oh, okay. Anyway, I have more stories. I'll put them in the sermon this morning. So uh, here we are. There's uh, handouts regarding voting your faith. I got a letter this morning from a local pastor that says, hey, you can't separate politics from, from Bible, from, from your religion, from your faith. And so uh, we're going to vote your faith. And there's more of them available back there today. And uh, I've, I've told you, you know, back at the OC, they used to hand you the Republicans voter guide. Now they're saying, hey, just vote your faith. You know, you read the Bible and, you know, you, you know what's up, so vote your faith. Makes it simple, more simple. And then uh, Living Well Medical Clinic, they need help with uh, donations of new gently used items and some of the items needed are diapers, size, and that this thing's listed. You could just talk to Kim back here, and it's on here, the things that they need. And then they have this thing where you can go online. They have, it's like gift registries. So you can go to, they have registered at Target, and they have registered on Amazon, and then they say what they need, what the immediate need is. And so you can just go on there and buy it on the gift registry, and they deliver it to Living Well. They got it set up that way. They just deliver it right over to Living Well. That's pretty slick way to be able to take care of that and help them out. So uh, that's what's going on there. And Meal Train, keep signing up for that, it, uh, for those in need. That's, that is a great ministry. That People are so blessed by, uh, by you showing up with a meal. It's a great ministry. And then the library, you can check out books, and uh, you'll be able to donate books for the use in the mobile library, and you can see Ray Bomber to uh, make donations to that library. That's going to be cool, too. I already snagged one of the books out of there. So, uh, and then prayer requests, you know how, how that goes. You can call us, text us. You know, we can pray with you. You can fill a little paper out and put it in the agape box back there, but it's easier to call or text us or call the emergency prayer line if it's an emergency and uh, get on that. And then uh, Bible prophecy updates, you can see the flyer on that. And uh, that's always my go-to is uh, Amir Sarfati and uh, known him for years and lives right there and knows what's going on, so it's cool. And then uh, children's ministry volunteers needed. Again, you don't have to write the syllabus. You don't have to figure out what you're going to say. You can even just be a set of eyes out there to monitor and run down little escapees or whatever. So, uh, so sign up for that. That's always a blessing. Women's Tuesday morning prayer at Karen Kenny's house, 930. Contact her or, or Jan. Emergency prayer chain. You got the numbers for uh, Karen Cell. Emergency requests only. And then uh, women's brunch at Karen Kenny's on uh, September 4th at 9.30. So please bring your favorite brunch dish to share. And then uh, Bible study for women Wednesday starting September 11th, 9-11. So uh, I, I take that back. How about September 4th? Oh. Oh, yeah, please. You were supposed to be up here making an announcement. Slacker. Good morning. Nice to have you back, Pastor. <laughs> um, yes, so uh, women's Bible study is starting back up. and But the books will be available uh, next Sunday here. At, um, in the back with Kim, and the, but there's a sign-up sheet for, 
for the Bible study right now um, in the back at, at Kim's desk back there. So, um, but we are having a woman's brunch on September 4th for all the women of the church, everybody. It's not about the Bible study. It's about fall kickoff. And, um, but the books will be available there and, but it's for all the ladies. So anybody, whether you're coming to the Bible study or not, um, we'd love to have you there. So it, it's September 4th at Karen Kinney's house, 9.30 in the morning, and bring whatever you want. There's no sign-up sheet. Um, if you can bring something, that's great. If you can't, it's not a big deal. We'd just love to have you there. And we'll pray and, and fellowship, and it'll be, it'll be a good time to get together. So the Bible study is about the women of the Bible. And it's written by Shannon Bream. She's a newscaster on, on Fox News. And, um, and it's a very, very interesting book. She takes two women of the Bible each week. And it's about eight or nine weeks. It'll be eight or nine weeks. And there's no workbook. There's three questions in the back um, of each chapter. And so if you'll pick up your book next week here at church or Wednesday at the Women's Brunch and do the first chapter, the first study will be September 11th, Wednesday. So, um, and have that first chapter done and read and the introduction read and you'll be good. I look forward to seeing you. Yes. The books are 15 bucks. Thank you. The books are $15. So. And um, if, if that's a hardship, we have scholarship program too. So it's, n it's not a big deal if you can't. So hope to see you there. God bless you guys. Thank you. Thanks, Jan. Hey. Nice catch. Yeah, there's a, I think it was Barkley, B-A-R-C-L-A-Y, that he's a dead writer that has the women of the Bible, men of the Bible. He has a whole series. Yeah. So that's cool. Oh, thank you. That was great announcements. Thanks for standing up and taking over. So uh, <laughs> I needed that. And yes. Oh, the, the uh, gala? Yeah, yeah. The gala? It's free. Oh, okay. The fundraiser. October 3rd is a Thursday. It's probably at Twin Cities Church. Yeah. Cool. That's always fun to go serve. Kent. Cool. So that's a uh, get well card or thanks for Jesus saving your life several times because he had a massive heart attack and they had to jumpstart him two or three times. And uh, I, he, I saw a picture of him and Brittany, Brittany the other day and he's looking a lot better. So you can get a hold of Kent and sign that for Jerry Berger. And then, uh, let's see, prayer. We're going to continue to pray for Israel and the things that are going on in the Middle East. You can pray for, uh, for uh, Karen, or Karen, Karen, Karen's daddy, Larry's father-in-law, passed away last night. And uh, it, was, it was awesome, actually, because uh, he texted me during the week when I was up on the fire, and he says, hey, Jerry's. Uh, knocking on heaven's door and I said well have him hold out until I, I get home on Friday so I can come and get his empty tent Lori and I will come down there and, and uh, so he did and he waited until yesterday evening it was perfect timing you know I'd already gone over my study Lori had finished most of her stuff and hey Jerry snuck right on out of here I mean it was just 
slid out of there. And I mean, when he's laying in that bed, he was like, I thought he was going to scare me because he was just laying like this, just peaceful, calm, you know, just vacated his tent and, uh, and went up to heaven. So we had the honor of going up and uh, picking him up and hanging out with the Toomeys for a while and, and uh, shared a little pizza, shared a little prayer, and uh, it was cool. So we'll pray for Corin, and uh, especially. And then, uh, and then Jerry Berger, he's on here about his heart attack. We continue to pray for him. He's in Kentucky. I thought the men in Kentucky were really lucky. But uh, we'll pray for uh, peace for Nancy as well. Bill McIntosh had that three-way bypass. How's he doing? Better. Okay. Went for a ride. Cool. That's awesome. So continue to pray for him and Audrey as well. And then uh, see what else is going on here. Continue to pray for uh, Debbie Byler. She's uh, still has that constant nausea. And she needs provision for uh, finances because she lost her job throughout that whole ordeal. So continue to pray for her. And then uh, how's your brother and son-in-law doing? Oh, yeah. Oh, good. Praise the Lord. Yeah, that's awesome. And then uh, we continue to pray for our brother David Klein and continue to pray for uh, caregivers. They're... Uh, so they'd be lining up at his door. Good caregivers would be cool. And then Jen Triplett's continue, continuing to improve. And uh, I talked to Dwayne a couple weeks ago at a memorial service that I did, and she was getting ready to come home. I don't know if she made it home. Yeah, she was supposed to come home, and there was an insurance glitch, and there was a paperwork glitch, so she's stuck there for another week, but she's hoping. Oh, Okay. So maybe next weekend. And then Katrina, she had that massive cancer surgery. And I've been getting the updates on that. And they didn't have to take any of her ribs. They thought they were going to have to take most of her. Well, they said like three or four. And then Tommy was telling me that he saw an actual picture of it opened up and showed all of her ribs. And uh, they ended up not having to take any of the ribs. And then they had... They took a lot of the muscle and, and tissue out of here, so they had to, you know, put that all back together and do skin grafts. And Tom said he was at the fair, and, and uh, he was with Katrina and her son Alex, and Kat Katrina was eating ribs. And so <laughs> that was be just prior to the surgery. And it's like, well, you want to get as many ribs as you can. So, uh, but man, praise God, you talk about a miracle. I mean, unbelievable miracle just a miracle so praise God for that and uh, continue to pray for them her, her uh, husband Perry and yeah that's a miracle and then you know rain in August is a miracle you know I'm kind of tired of the rain but uh, that was impressive that was awesome and that very first rain that we had a couple weeks ago that's what jumped onto that fire and gave them just enough just enough to get out in front of it and uh, knock it down. Just that little bit of rain and the humidity coming up. It was amazing. So then this rain, we're walking around in six inches of dust all, you know, 12 hours a day. And now it's just six inches of mud. So it's, uh, I'd much rather have been walking around in mud. But God's good. That's, that's an amazing turn of events up there for that whole thing. So. We want to continue to pray for our uh, first responders and our men and women in, that serve our country. And uh, 
it's always an honor to be able to do that. Just thinking about, they're deployed all over the world. And uh, we had, while we were scrolling through that, we had National Guard come and, and help us out. They had uh, some crews, National Guard crews, a bunch of tough stud kids, men and women. And so that was cool. We had them for a couple of days. And uh, serving our, they're serving our country, fighting fire. And then our first responders as well. There was a few times that I uh, drove home from Chico. I started, uh, I, I stayed at Bingo's house for a couple of nights, and I thought, yeah, I'd much rather be at home. So I'd drive home. <laughs> no offense, Bingo. And uh, I would drive home, and so I'd get home at 9 o'clock, hang out with Mama for till about 11, and I have to be up at 4 so I could get back to Chico and, and be at uh, briefing at 7. So the longest night I've had in a few weeks was... Uh, Friday night after we got home and I woke up at six o'clock in the morning and thought man I'm going to be late oh don't have to go so anyway let's pray Heavenly Father we thank you you're an amazing God and Lord I just uh, am I, I'm always just blown away that we can talk to the creator of the universe and that you hear our cries not only hear our cries you, you're concerned for us and you take care of all of our needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. We thank, we're thankful for that. It's amazing what you do with the modern medicine, that, that you're behind all that. It is a, truly a miracle. And Lord, I just think about that rain. Lord, it doesn't rain in August unless you want it to rain in August. And it's just amazing your timing. And Lord, I'm just thinking about those, you know, the big party at Burning Man. And you can rain on that too. If, if, if you'd like. That was coming up, and I just, that would be good. So uh, your will be done. But Lord, we're just thankful that you can just reach into our lives and, and, uh, and change things. And if we pay attention, it, it happens quite regularly. And so we're just thankful for that, Lord. And I just pray you continue to uh, bless those that serve our country. Lord, you keep them out of harm's way. Same with our uh, first responders. Lord, that you continue to bless them and their families. And Lord, we're just thankful that uh, we have the country that we have to live in. And as crazy it is, it, as it is, we know that you're a sovereign God. You see the whole parade. You see the beginning from the end. And we know that you're in control. And so, Lord, we're thankful that, uh, that we're, we fall under your umbrella, Lord, in, in grace and mercy. And we're just thankful for that. Lord, we're uh, thankful, Lord, that uh, Jerry got to sneak out of here yesterday evening and uh, just so peacefully and just pray that uh, we're thankful that, that he's with his, reunited with his wife and, and uh, just pray for Karen that you'd give her peace and uh, when those sorrows like sea billows roll, Lord, that she would know your presence. And, and I just pray you'd bless her and, and uh, Larry, especially during this time. And Lord, I pray for all, all of us that have lost loved ones recently or lost loved ones, Lord, that those, those sorrows like sea billows roll keep rolling. Maybe not as hard over the years, but they just keep rolling. And so we just pray, Lord, that you would that we would all know your presence during those times, Lord. And we can rest and be thankful to the fact that our loved ones are in heaven. So, Lord, I just pray you bless this time that we share together. Holy Spirit, thank you for being here. Pray that you'll be blessed here this morning. And uh, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And I want to thank Pastor Tommy for doing such a great job. Yes. I got all kinds of kudos. <laughs> Let's stand.
Lord, I just pray that would be the song on our hearts every morning before we, our feet even hit the floor. Give us Jesus. And we're thankful that we have Jesus. And so, Lord, I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would teach us this morning from your word. I pray you'd bless children's ministry, that they'd learn something new today. And, and Lord, that you would just bless this time we share together in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Right on. Simple youth, you can youth on out of here. The rest of us, we're going to be in the book of James this morning. Finished up Hebrews, moving on to James. Um, looking forward to that. Kinda. <laughs> to 
depends on, uh, you know, how much you can take getting beat up, you know. <clears throat> Jared Simmons, he's still out there on the fire. He's up at Red Bluff, and we actually didn't get to cross paths up there. We're in the same base camp for a day, well, for a couple minutes in a day. And, uh, but he's still up there. Maybe he's watching. He's on. Hi, Jared. Hope you get to come home soon. Let's see. There we go. All right. It's the intro to James. We'll be in James chapter 1, mostly in verses 1 through 3, counting it joy. So in the beginning of, of the letter of James, and, and I took this quote out of the uh, ESV where it tells you a little synopsis about what the book says. It says sometimes it's called the Proverbs of the New Testament. The book of James practically and faithfully reminds Christians how to live. And so as we read through these five chapters of, of James, we're very quickly made aware of the fact that ultimately God's word isn't given to us that we, so we can gain more knowledge. God's word is given to us so that our lives might be changed. And the emphasis in this letter of James is not about becoming Christians. He's talking to people that are Christians, and so it's about behaving as Christians. And it's important that those of us who would profess to be Christians would face up to these particular and pressing challenges, and, and they are challenges. Like, for example, it's hard for somebody who uses words to be confronted by James's teaching to use and abuse the use and abuse of the tongue. In fact, he says in James 3.10, from the same mouth come blessing and cursing, my brothers, these things ought not to be so. And so that was one of the things that I was just talking about running into on the fire. It's just like, wow. And you know what? It, it, it's like I told this kid, it's 2 Timothy 2.22 is to flee from youthful lusts. Youthful lust there is so you can sound like everybody else and be cool. Okay? And, and pursue righteousness, faith, and love, and peace with those who call on the Lord with a pure heart. So it means choose your friends. If you hang out with people that have a foul mouth, it's probably going to have a foul mouth. You know? And so he's, he, you know, he gets that. He, he said, yeah. And you know what? For th I think it was three days. Didn't hear him cuss. And so I said, see, that's good. I'm proud of you. So you look at this, and this is what James is it's all about. If you're going to profess to be a Christian, it's how you live as a Christian. You know, I don't know if that makes you cringe at all, you know, when out of the same mouth comes blessing and cursing. But maybe you're perfect. Yeah, it kind of makes me cringe. And so James 3, 2 says, he covers that as well. He says, for we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man able also to bridle his whole body. So if you can control the tongue, you can tr control your whole body. Or if we're tempted to play favorites with people, and particularly as it relates to the church, then we have James 2. It, and that's going to be distinctly uncomfortable for all of us. And in fact, it may actually be uncomfortable. This whole journey we make through uh, James might be uncomfortable all the way through for uh, us. But in a way, that will prove to be very positive for it's forcing us to sit up and take notice it's forcing us to sit up and, and uh, pay attention so you see whenever our conduct doesn't match the belief that we declare then these five chapters have something to say to us and if we pay no attention then we pay no attention to our own immediate danger so now when we study the bible together it's obviously it hits home to our hearts in different ways you know, the Bible says something to you, something to me. We all get something different out of the Bible. And after all, we're all people, right? We're all individuals. But many of us would consider ourselves to be part of the family of God. You know, I look around here, all of us, all of us would consider ourselves to be part of the family of God. And so when we studied the Bible together in this way, we would anticipate that God would speak to us not only as a family, but also in the wider church family. And we look at this together, we're going to discover that there's far more imperatives in this than there is indicative. The indicative sense indicates what is. 
The imperative sense has to do with exhortation and application. And we're going to find that there's 108 verses in here in James. We're going to find in those 108 verses there's like 60 imperatives. And, and the, these just kind of jump out of the, when we start reading it, they kind of jump out off the pages at us, as it were. You know, for example, in verse 5, he says, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God. That's an imperative. You know, and then in the King James it says, and he will give it liberally. That doesn't mean that he's going to take wisdom from somebody else that has more wisdom and give it to us. I think that's why they changed it in the ESV. It says he'll give it generously. Okay? And so that's the kind of imperative statement. Verse 19, he says, know this. He says, know this. That's imperative. He's basically saying, hey, I want you to listen up. Know this. I want you to listen up. He says in verse 26, paraphrase, I want you to be quiet. I want you to hold your tongue. And then in, in James 2.1, he says, don't show fav- favoritism. And, and they go on and on and on in here. There's, like I said, 60-something. There's a whole bunch of them. And so they're here to be discovered. We're going to discover them, and we're going to come across them as we go through this. So something that we ought to recognize is that we're all in this together, okay? We're all in this together. We're in the same boat. James 3, 1 and 2. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For because, because we all stumble in many ways. We're all the same. We all stumble in many ways. We're in this together. You know, and there's something a little unsettling about that. that It's just a fact. We all stumble in many ways. There's also something a little encouraging about that. In that we can say, we're all in this stumbling class. Okay? We might not be the fastest growers, spiritually. But we know this. That we're all finally in the stumbling group. Okay, we're in the sanctification process. We're working our way through that. And I believe that God has something to say to all of us in this as stumblers. And that's what God is saying through his word in James. He's saying that actions speak louder than words. You know, I I remember a guy telling me, hey, don't tell me you're a Christian. I don't want to hear that you're a Christian. Show me you're a Christian. I want to see if you're a Christian. So in other words, if the book of James takes root in my life, if the book of James takes root in your life, then there's going to be this visible impact on those around us. You know, and I experienced that a lot in the last few weeks. Because as soon as that little kid says, hey, he's a pastor, you can see immediately that they're going to, oh, then we're going to talk differently you know, and then somebody would come up and this old man comes up and I mean, it's just, and somebody says something about, man, do you eat with that mouth? And he's just like, hey, I don't, I don't give a, you know, and I have this religious friend and I don't even care. And these guys all around me start laughing. He must not know. <laughs> I said, he probably doesn't know. And then they said, hey, he's a pastor. I didn't know that. Yeah, well, now you know. And so then after I walked away and I told him, I said, yeah, I'm not offended. He, you know, he got, apologized. I said, I'm not offended. You know, I hear that stuff all the time. And I went through the whole professional thing with him. But then after I walked away, he says to that little kid I'm with, is he really a pastor? <laughs> yeah. So, so it's like, hey, actions speak louder than words. So in other words, the book of James, again, is going to take root in our lives. It's going to change us from the inside out. We're going to have impact we're going to have an impact, a positive impact on those around us. And that is, is our faith must naturally find itself on display. It just should be coming naturally. It should be like second nature, actually first nature, that it comes out on display. Our faith must naturally begin to function in a way that is unavoidably hard to miss, that it's there. And for that reason, it makes this our lives as Christians distinctly challenging. It's a challenge. You know, for people to be able to say that there's an observable, that we can see a difference in us, and directly as a result of becoming doers. James 1, 
22, but be doers of the word, not only, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves, which is provided for us in, in these chapters. Now, one of the things during briefing, they have the guy that's air support, and he gets up there, he's from Red Bluff, and they, they just do it live from Red Bluff uh, via camera to these big screens when we're in Chico. And every day, he would tell you how many airplanes, how many helicopters, how many helicopters from the National Guard fly at night, that, and night capability to go out there and drop retardant. And then he always says, always, every day, clear eyes, full hearts, park family, together forever. And so you don't think I made fun of that? Yeah, I did. And so I, and they would always talk about needle casting. Never heard of needle casting. But when they do these, you know, fire lines with bulldozers and the trees are dead, they died in the fire. Then when the wind comes up, there's needle casting from the pine trees. And the needle castings go on to the newly cut uh, fire line. And so be careful of that because if the wind comes up, then the fire line can catch on fire because of the dry pine needles. And so they, you know, make this whole big thing about that. And it's, it's all cool. But so when we would break out and we'd go to our other briefings, sometimes they would say, hey, like this guy from Orange County, he's, he's in charge of us. And he says, I'm from Orange County. We don't have trees like this in Orange County. I don't even know, I don't know what you guys know. You guys just keep doing what you're doing. And if you guys need something, my job is to provide it. If you guys have a question, my job is to find out what the answer is. You know, and if anybody can help me with that, if anybody can, you know, give me any kind of, uh, I can't remember the word that he used, but if, if anybody could, you know, give me any help in that or give me some kind of suggestions that would help me, then I would really appreciate that. And so I walked up to him and I said, Jesus loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. That's the best I can give you. And he says, thank you. Everybody needs to hear that. Well, then these, you know, these other guys, that, that guy, he says, okay, here is the word for the day. The word for the day, this is the guy that says, clear eyes, full heart. Here's the word for the day. Be safe. Well, that's two words. Okay. So I go through that whole thing when we break up, and he says, does anybody, anybody have anything to say? And I say, yes, because you forgot. Clear eyes, full hearts, park family forever until the fire's over, right? We get sent home. But here's the deal. Here's the word for the day. Doo-doo. It's not what you don't do. It's what you do-do. And that's a quote from Pastor Todd. He's preaching in James, I think it was, and he says that. I walked up to him. I said, Pastor, you said doo-doo from the, pulp the pulpit. <laughs> okay, so it's not what you don't do, James says. It's what you do do. But be doers of the word. Doers, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So in the first verse, James right here, in the first verse, we'll start with this, that you know, he's introduced us as the, as the writer, James, and he introduces himself and he is the brother of Jesus. This is James, the brother of Jesus. James 1.1. 1, 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes in the dispersion greetings. So it's a miracle of God's goodness to him in opening his eyes to understand that Jesus is who Jesus is and Jesus is who Jesus said he was. He's the person that he declared himself to be. He doesn't drop he's my brother card because he didn't believe it. And then when God opened his eyes to it, he doesn't drop the, the, uh, the fact that he's my brother. He drops the fact that, oh, my God opened my eyes to the understanding that he, that's true. Jesus is who he is. See, John 7, 5, it says, for not even his brothers believed in him. It's an interesting statement that, that many of the people that, that uh, were coming to believe in Jesus, there were a lot of people, but the people that were right next to him, the people that lived in the same house as he did or grew up with him, they didn't believe him. Paul, in his great chapter on the resurrection, points out, that in, in one of the resurrection appearances, Jesus appeared specifically to James, his brother. 1 Corinthians 
15, 7. And then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And by the time we get into the writing of, of, the, of the history book, which is the book of Acts, this James, the brother of Jesus, he's at the very heart of the council of, of the churches in Jerusalem, where the people in Jerusalem and the church are working out their relationships with each other between the Jewish believers and the Gentile believers. And James is at the very core of calling for Christian unity in this whole episode, that whole episode that took place in the book of Acts. Acts 15, 13 through 19. He says, after they finished speaking, James replied, brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. And then he quotes from Amos 9 and Jeremiah 12. He says, after this, I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord. And all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from, a, from of old. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. So there's obviously a division between the Jews and Gentiles, and he's trying to hold it together there. And James is a great illustration of what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.16. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. And so he's, that's, that's great words of wisdom right there. And what Paul is showing is that there's an amazing change that is brought about in a person who, who comes to believe in Jesus. Until they come to believe in Jesus, they go their own way. They view things completely with the, by the world's perspective. And they don't have any interest in, in, in these things, these things about Jesus. But when they are reconciled with God, they are no longer look at people the same way that they once did. And, and we, can, we all can relate to that. We look at people differently now. We no longer look you know, at Jesus the way, the way they once did. We, and they no longer look at Jesus the way they once did. And this is essentially the testimony of James. He's, his testimony is, hey, I no longer look at my brother the way I once did. I, that's, I have a new testimony. And actually, he introduces himself as a servant of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he heaps on these designations of, of Jesus, Lord, Lord, which is the word that's used when they translated in the Old Testament into Greek, and they translated the unpronounceable Y-H-W-H, which we say Yahweh. And they translated that to Lord. So whenever we find in the New Testament Lord, it's not an expression of devotion. It's a, it's a designation of dignity or identity. And that's what James says. He says, I'm a servant of God and of the Lord. And then, and then Jesus, that's Joshua, which means God is salvation or God is Savior. And Christ, which is anointed one or Messiah. And notice what he is. He is a servant. James is a servant. Servanthood is like become passe. It's like... that's. It, People used to be servants. We don't want to be servants anymore. Take, for example, the titles that are given people in the structures of business or the structures of education. There's almost this intense desire to make people think or make people, so everybody realize that you are not a servant. You know, you're a manager or you're a sub-manager or you're an assistant to the assistant or you're an assistant to the assistant manager or you're the assistant to whatever, but you're not a servant. And you look at, that, at what we discovered James doing, and he says, my name's James, and I'm a servant of Jesus. And if, if, if we know that if you're a Christian, that's the biggest deal. That's the biggest deal for all of us, that, of being a servant. We're a servant. And that's the biggest deal for me, too. 
We may be a servant carpenter. We may be a servant homeschool teacher. We may be a servant educator. We may be a servant mom. We may be a servant painter. We may be a servant whatever you are. But we're a servant. But ultimately, our best entry on on our resume is this, that we are a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, even in our best days, in our best days of, of being servants, we're unprofitable servants. You know, we shouldn't be surprised by this either. After all, the brother of Jesus, he would have paid attention to his brother and been marveled at him when he said in Matthew 20, 28, paraphrase, hey, I didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as, as ransom for many. And so James says, well, I can emulate my brother in that. James, a servant of God and a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to emulate my brother. And the readers, well, they're the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. And what does this mean? Is, is, does this mean it's distinctly Jewish and doesn't have anything to do with the Gentiles? But we could be helped by 1 Peter 1, 1 and 2. Peter writes, uh, Peter, an apostle of, of Jesus Christ, to those who are, the, are elect exiles in the dispersion of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for the sprinkling of his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. See, there's a distinct simil- similarity there between Peter's introduction and James's introduction. You know, it doesn't have the same terminology explicitly, explicitly, but it's pretty similar. And Peter designates himself as the apostle, an apostle of Jesus, one who has been set apart, one who's been sent by Jesus. He's writing to God's elect. You know, they're strangers in the world. They're they're passing through. This world is not our home. They're scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, and and so on. And, And their distinguishing feature is that they all belong to God the Father, sprinkled by the blood of Jesus, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So in James 1 1, he writes to these people, the 12 tribes, who are scattered among the nations. James seems to be just expanding the term, which was, in, which was in, an inclusive term of if Israel itself. Israel was scattered. And so the, the, the Israel of God that had been redeemed out of the bondage of Egypt, right, as a result of, the, of shedding of blood, and Israel that had been scattered and was at this point in time scattered throughout the world as well. So every Jewish person looked at the possibility of their return to their homeland. In fact, they always saw themselves in terms of their identity of being linked directly to the Passover, where they returned back to their homeland and to the prospect of their reunification as, as the family of God. And it's the same is true today. It hasn't changed. The same is true. So James takes this and he expands it. And he includes in, in the terminology, it would seem... You know, all, regardless of nationality, all, regardless of nationality, no matter what color you are, all, everybody who trusts in Jesus Christ as Savior, that we're all in the same family. And we have to wait until verse 18 to get all the real indication of this, where he says in, in James 1.18, for his own will be brought for his own will be brought us forth by the word of truth. Of his own. Thank you. I was thinking, man, that doesn't make sense to me. Who writes like that? Well, it's because you have to read it correctly. Of his own will be brought us forth by the word of truth, and we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And then you'll notice he begins in chapter 2 addressing the believers. As you hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. And what we find then in these epistles, and expressly again back in 1 Peter 2, it picks up the Old Testament pictures. They're looking back at the Old Testament. And they pick up the Old 
Testament uh, pictures. We saw that a lot in Hebrews. We got a lot of Old Testament history lessons out of Hebrews. But they apply them directly to this multicolored company of both Jew and Gentile. Where he says in verse 9, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into the marvelous, his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And so in the same way as the Hebrew people would look and, and do look, they, and they do look for a day when they return to Jerusalem. So the believers of the Lord Jesus Christ are scattered throughout the world, anticipating the day of our great homecoming when we all get together. And that's why we see it's, it's important to us, you know, as loyal ones to, the, to this country, you know, as uh, the passion that we have for, uh, for the country that we live in, whether it's this land or, or, or the land that we were born in or, or adopted or our adopted home, it's, it's important to always remember that the Christian's homeland is, is uh, heaven, that this world is not our home, <clears throat> that our ultimate destination is there, and that the affairs of this world, as crazy it is, as it is, as dramatic as it is, as, as unsettling as, as it is, both internally within the nation and externally with, throughout the world, and, and we've never seen it like this before, but it's crazy. The only real way for us to gain any sense of sensibility in this vastness of all this is to take refuge in the, in the designations that, that, that he just laid out here, that this world is not our home. We're just passing through. And to recognize that we are those who are scattered throughout the world. We are those. But God knows that we're scattered throughout the world, and God has a plan to deal with the scattering. It's a beautiful thing. Might not be needle casting, but it's, but you know, it's Christian casting. Now, once James has identified himself and he identified his recipients of this letter, he's going to tell the redeemed people of God how to live. He's going to tell us, he's going to explain to us how, how it should look. Well, that's helpful, isn't it? You know, to get some plan here. So here in the letter, he tells us how to live in this world. How are we supposed to live? You know, I'm, how am I supposed to go to work? How, how should I treat people? How do I handle this situation? How do I handle that situation? And in case we should feel like that he's taken a, a long time to get going, you know, he launches right into the heart of things. He confronts his, his readers with this disturbing yet liberating fact that the display of a Christian faith is not, is not to be revealed in some joyful, uh, otherworldly experience, but is revealed in the craziness of everyday life. It's like, that's real. When it's crazy and we're able to display that we're Christians, that we're set apart, that, that people can look at us and think, yeah, there's something different about you. You know, when I explain to those guys, they, hey, that's just unprofessional. You just shouldn't talk like that. I remember working on a house up here in, in uh, the ranchos one time, and, and I was helping a contractor, and he'd been there for a while. And, and so then I showed up, and I'm doing the, the cabinets. And, and the people that are there are, you can tell by their bumper stickers, <laughs> they're straight up heathen dogs, you know? And uh, so, yeah, whatever. I'm just doing my work. And then a couple of days go by, and this, it was, this guy says, oh, this guy's my pastor. And she goes, I knew there was something different about him. Yeah, well, that's good. I like that. So here he goes, James 1.1. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Or as J.B. Phillips paraphrases it, when all kinds of trials and temptations crowd into your lives, my brothers, don't resent them as intruders, but welcome them as friends. When all kinds of temptations crowd into our lives. 
when all kinds of trials crowd into our lives. Let's just be honest, okay? Our, our lives are crowded. They're crowded. It, they're crowded in upon all kinds of trials and temptation. And if that's not true, then you're dead. Because if you're, if you're alive, it's true. We are not the completed story yet. We're still in that sanctification process. We're going to have trials and temptations. We're not in heaven yet. We're in the middle of this situation. We're in the middle. We're in the middle of this craziness. And living in this world places demands upon all of us. It confronts us with challenges. It, it buffets us in ways that are painful, in ways that are sorrowful. And it confronts us with things that are, bring failure, that bring tears, that, that doubts and disappointments, cries and groanings, trials and temptations. It's a battle. It's a challenge. You know, one of the greatest illusions in life is this, is when we look at somebody else, doesn't matter who it is, I don't care who the person is, you look at somebody else and you think, man, I wish I was them. I wish I was them because they, obviously, they don't go through what I go through. I mean, and there's times I'm carrying wood, firewood, in two feet of snow, blowing sideways, 10 o'clock at night, and I think of somebody. He doesn't carry firewood, two feet of snow at 10 o'clock at night. He's sitting in his mansion someplace and having somebody else carrying the firewood. In fact, they don't even have firewood. They just have, you know. And I just think to myself, yeah, it keeps you young, Jeff. Just keep going. I don't say that. I say, alloways, stop. Just keep going. So you look at this, you know, so you look at them, you know, we, we, uh, I wish I was them. Well, they obviously got it down, right? They got it down. Or, or uh, what do they know about this? You know, if ever we were to start at a point in this room, we can go around the point in this, you know, just go around in this room, and, uh, and we could share an area of trial or temptation in each one of our lives. You know, we'd be here a lot longer than we'd want to be here before we completed that. And I don't need to go beyond my own heart to tell you that in the last 29 years of pastoral life, it's introduced me to every front of trials and temptation from all angles. And we all face trials and temptation, and they're multifaceted. And then they come to us whenever, wherever, and they come in all kinds of ways from all kinds of directions, and they blindside you. And you go, man, what is that? What is that? You know, we're all in this. There's no exemption from this. We can't pass on this. We can't say, okay, I'm passing on the trials and temptation, okay? We can never get out of this. We have a life sentence of this on this side of heaven. That's my experience. And just when we think we, we, we finished one, here comes another one. It never ends. And the world may say to us, hey, you know what? Just deny it. Think positive. Pretend it's not happening. Maybe it'll just go away. Maybe it'll just leave you. You can just forget about it or deny that it has an impact on you. Live above it. You know, choose for yourself, you know, to, to, to go beyond it, whatever, whatever it might be. Or resent it and grow miserable and bitter. And if, it, like, this horrible intruder came into your life and scattered everything all over the place and then ran away and left you desolate. But no, what does James say? He says, consider it pure joy when you face trials of various kinds. Well, that seems like a straight-up contradiction, right? Joy, trials. Most of our present-day life is, is lived trying to deal with life in, in such a way that we don't have trials. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get into a place where we say, I don't have any trials anymore. Everything's good. It's all good. And if we can avoid trials, then we can have joy. That's what we're looking for. We're going to try to avoid trials so we can actually have joy in our life. But if we have trials, we can't possibly have joy. That's what we think. Because of that, we have to get rid of these trials and in some way. So then we can get joy. That's when joy begins. But James says, no, no. No, if you want pure, unadulterated joy, then you're going to... Find it in your trials. It's crazy. 
We've experienced that, though. We know it's true. You see, when this begins to infect a life, then we have, you know, a different impact. We have a totally different impact because people are so used to the Christian success story. Right? They're so used to the Christian overcomer, overcoming story. They're so used to the beautiful people story. You know, so that the unsuccessful, right, or, or the non-beautiful or the non-overcomers, they say, well, I can't even go in there. I can't even go. There's no point for me to even going into a church. There's no point of me even being a Christian. Those people have it all together. I remember that when we were over in Ireland years ago. You know, this, this young girl, I mean, I told you that it was a youth group. There's probably 50, 60 kids there. It was called a club. And uh, so the youth pastor says, hey, since we have guys or people from the United States here that are going to talk to us, we only have one smoke break tonight. And so that youth pastor was out there lighting the kids' cigarettes and stuff. And so after the end, we, you know, we do questions and answers. And, and one of the kids raises his hand and he says, hey, are we going to go to hell for smoking cigarettes? I said, no. I said, you, you might get to heaven quicker and smell like hell. <laughs> but I said, but another person says, we can't. We can't be saved because we're not perfect. Everybody in America is perfect. And so they can be saved. I said, well, you watch too much TV. All that's fake. All, you know, 90210, that's fake. That's all fake. It ain't real. And so that's what, you know, it comes to where the people think, oh, yeah, well, I, I, can't, I can't be around those people because they have it all together. They think, that, they think that because we don't tell the truth. That's why they think that. Because we have one of the finest cover-up societies known to men. Yeah, it's all good. And we baptize it with, with Christian belief. And, and we baptize it with Christian doctrine. And we baptize it in our own little Christianese language. Because if we're able to, if we're a, ever, you know, we're going to admit the mess that we really are, then maybe we would magnify the wonder of who God really is and draw people to God rather than to us. Because you need to look at God instead of, oh, yeah, those people have it all together. God has it all together. So James says, the way in which we can count it joy is not by moving ourselves to a monastery and, and hiding from trials and temptation, be absent from that trouble, but it's to put your attitude, it's how your attitude is in that trouble. That's what he's saying. And how do we do it? James 1.1, how do we do it? How do we call it all joy, account it all joy? My brothers, when we meet various kinds of tri uh, trials, why would I do that? Why would I count it all joy when I'm in a trial? Well, he says, look at verse 3, 4, because, because you know. That's what he says, because you know. In other words, we have to bring how we feel under, under the command of what we know. Right? Because it's not about feelings. It's what we know, that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. If we continue to put what we know under the condition of what we feel, then we will make all of our knowing submissive to our feelings. It's backwards. But this is true in, in so many areas of our life. This is true. So there's a progression because... You know that the testing of your faith develops steadfastness. It develops perseverance. It develops patience. Faith by itself does not develop perseverance. It's only faith that is tested. It's only faith that is exercised. You know, uh, one of the water tender guys, man, he was, he's standing there. He's got this big beard, and he's, he's got a shirt on, and he is yoked. I mean, he's just... Huge muscles. So I just walk up to him. I do this to people like this all the time. Lori hates it. <clears throat> I walk up to him and I just grab his bicep. I couldn't even put my hand around. I said, dude, you need to start working out because you're starting to suck up. You know? <laughs> Looks like you're starting to suck up a little. And he goes, really? 
He goes, really? Yeah. So he goes into his water tender, his water truck, and he brings out dumbbells. He carries dumbbells. And he says, I, was, I saw him over there. I thought he was stretching. He's got like one leg and he's doing this. I can't even do it. He goes, I was just doing my leg workout. Oh, my. Yeah, well, see, if you're not working out, if you're not exercising, you're sucking up. So it just goes away. What happens is, is it's our faith grows. Our faith gets stronger when we're tested, when we're exercised, when our faith is exercised. Faith becomes significant under stress. And so the very things that we seek to avoid are the very things that make us. Otherwise, our faith wanes. It goes away. The the Puritans had it right. Trials come to make us and to remake us. In shunning trials, we miss blessings. That's what James is saying. Consider it pure joy when you face trials of various kinds. (sighs) When whatever it is, when whatever it is, we don't need to go into all the details of it, right? Whatever it might be, different from one another, but all of us understand it. Whatever we face, whenever we face that, consider it pure joy because you know that now you have a chance to turn that trial into something of significance, something of importance. And when the testing is significant and is succeeded upon, steadfastness is produced. And if steadfastness, when we have that, it gives way to maturity. We grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 4, and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So unbelieving people, and this is it. Unbelieving people, they cry out, oh God, what do you think you're doing? Why are you doing this? Why is God doing this? And the Christian person, through all the pains, they can't even pray. They say, oh Father, oh God, oh Father, my Father. And sometimes that's all. And sometimes that's the whole prayer. That's all you can get out, Father. And that is the one indication of of the reality of saving faith right there in one word. It's a little wonder that Jesus told the Pharisees, I have no interest in your convoluted, lengthy prayers, all of your chaos, all of your beliefs. And this is the last part, Romans 8. Paul nails it. He says, for in this hope we were saved. We're saved. We're saved from the wrath of God. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who reaches or search his hearts, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things, all things, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your word. And so, Lord, I just pray that we'd meditate on these things and and, you know, when it, when it does seem like it's a contradiction that we're going to count it all joy when we fall into various trials and temptations and problems and issues. But as we see, as we exercise our faith in who God is and knowing that you are a sovereign God and that you're in control of everything and in your providence you work out things in our life and you put people before us and that when we exercise our faith it changes us and people see the difference. We display who we are in Christ. I just pray that we would remember that as we think on this. And, uh, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you that we serve an amazing God and we love you. And we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.
all my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing Of the goodness of God Of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire In darkest night You are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend I have lived in the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every Thank you for uh, joyfully enduring. <laughs> wow. It went by fast. I think I did announcements too long or something. But it's those stories. Anyway, God bless you guys. Thanks for being here. We got to stack chairs and uh, we can mingle around and, and enjoy each other's fellowship and.
come uh, about 12, 15, you're trespassing. So hang out. God bless you guys. If you need anything, let us know.